Today we're going to talk about petri nets. Um, and uh, what petri nets are is, again, they're a formal specification method. So, you know, we talked about informal methods, we talked about semi-formal methods, and now we're focusing on some formal methods. This means the formal methods are a little bit harder to learn, take a little more effort, uh, but uh, the benefit is they provide some um, guaranteed, uh, some provable uh, characteristics. A problem with, with petri nets is they're not terribly um, easy to apply to systems. Um, and so I've been teaching about petri nets for uh, years, decades even, and uh, keep thinking uh, that they're going to go away. But they don't because they do have value to, uh, because again, they have some provability um, metrics or, or um, uh, capabilities. Uh, that are important for theoretical work. Uh, but we're going to go ahead and go through the syntax and the use of these things. And uh, again, the challenge is in finding a way to apply the PetriNet methodology to your particular problem. So here's the basic syntax um, that circles are uh, um, representative of places or what we call nodes. Transitions are either represented by boxes or um, a, a heavy line. And then there are inputs and outputs um, to transitions. And uh, an important aspect is the markers or the marks or tokens. Um, and they can be represented by dots, for example, or a number. Um, and, uh, and that's important. When you have a petri net, so again, a petri net is just a diagram, a lot like our data flow diagrams or our um, flow charts um, and things. But again, the syntax is very unique uh, because it's really about multitasking and synchronization. Petri nets are not so much used for program and data flow, and that's why they can be hard to apply. Um, so um, here's an initial marking. Um, this indicates how the net starts. Um, and so here we have a net. These are equivalent, okay, because it's just the difference in the syntax where the uh, marks and the transitions have been represented in these alternate ways. I prefer this method over here. We're using dots for the tokens. Um, again, arrows represent the transitions and, uh, or I'm sorry, arrows represent the inputs and outputs and the bar represents the transition, okay? Now, here is um, one of the ambiguities in the system is what causes a tra transition to fire. Um, and uh, But what we talk about is an event um, associated with a transition, basically, that, that uh, causes it to fire. And a transition can only fire if all of its inputs have um, a token behind them. Um, and um, so the example here are um, in this input to this transition. Um, it has one input and there are two tokens, so it only needs one token to fire. So this input will be able to fire. Oh, look, there's another input to this same transition. And in fact, yes, this, uh, this place has a token in it to consume, and therefore, um, this input is satisfied that it has a token. This input is satisfied that it has a token. And so this transition is enabled to fire. Okay? Um, and this is the output. If it does fire, then this output is going to produce one token. And so it's important to note that these tokens are consumed and produced by the transition. So an input consumes the token if it's available. An output uh, produces a token um, out of thin air in this case. And uh, um, because it's putting it into the place, we don't, you know, transitions aren't associated with a supply of tokens. Uh, they just consume and then provide. Um, okay, so in this instance, this is ready to fire. Um, when it fires, one of these tokens will disappear, doesn't matter which one. One of them will be removed, 
this one will be removed, but another one will be placed. And so when this fires once, it started with a marking of two over here and one here. After it fires, there'll be one and one, which will allow it to fire again. If it fires again, though, this is going to go to zero, this will remain at one, and then it won't be able to fire. Okay? Um, so, we can go down this little table, and, and that's a typical way to deal with a petri net. This is an example, and this is, in fact, out of the Phil LaPlante book. Um, but it's a very simple net. We saw it before that uh, before firing, we see the table, the ta uh, token marking. Um, and that's what we do is we say place one and place two. It starts out at uh, M0, that's the uh, initial state. Has two tokens in place one, one token in place two. Um, so this one's enabled, this one's enabled, it's ready to fire. After it fires, again, one is going to be consumed, just like we said on the previous page, it'll go to 1-1. One, one. Then, what's the next marking if it fires again? Because this is still able to fire. And as we said, it's going to be 0 over here and 1 over here. Okay? See, that's what we're indicating here. Is this is after the first firing. They get consumed, but then gets reproduced. So before firing, the consuming process after firing. Now, all transitions throughout the table are synchronized, and transitions are triggered by an event. Could be a clock. So you could use petri nets to augment the state transition diagrams and the data real-time data flow diagrams, right, that we used previously to help define when the clocks happen, for example, or when these, uh, um, these synchronization functions. Now, here's an example with multiple transitions. Okay, again, they're all enabled simultaneously. So, you can see there's a transition here. It has one input and one output. So there has to be, in order for this transition to be enabled, it, there has to be at least one token here. Likewise, one, one input, one output, one input, one output. So, the inputs are going to consume, the outputs are going to produce. Um, and so these are, this is enabled, this is enabled, and this is enabled. Now, we have to evaluate all the transitions to see which ones will fire. Um, and you can imagine that, yep, okay, this is enabled, this is enabled, this is going to, uh, already has two. It starts out with an initial marking of one, one, two, and zero. And so this can fire, we'll produce one more token there, but it'll consume it. So that'll go to zero. This can fire, that'll go to zero. That'll be another token. There are now four tokens there. And this, of course, can fire. Um, and now it's going to have a total of four tokens. So it could actually have its, um, fire four times. But these are empty, right? After they've fired, they're empty. Um, this can fire until all the tokens in place three disappear. Um, and then these won't produce any more. Okay. Now that produces a problem because even though petri nets are a formal method and they're used for proofs, they can be non-deterministic. So here's an example where again, we evaluate the transition simultaneously. Remember we said that. So um, now here is a little bit different where we transition T1 has two inputs. And remember, there has to be a token for each input. And it has two inputs and one output. Likewise, P1 has, I'm sorry, T2 has three inputs from uh, different places. And T3 has two inputs one place, and then one output. Hmm. So, if you look at this, we can evaluate this and say, yeah, that's not ready to fire. This one, yep, there are two, there's a, there's a token behind each, each of its inputs. This one, yep, there's a token behind each of its inputs. And this one, yep, there's a token behind each of its inputs. 
So we can say all three of these are enabled to fire. Um, however, if both T3 is going to consume both of the tokens in place P3, and transition T2 is going to consume one of the tokens from place P3. But this needs two tokens to fire, and this needs at least one token to fire. So depending on which one fires, the other one will be deprived. Right? And so the order is not determined. <laughs> and, and likewise, what we said is all multiple transitions are enabled simultaneously. So they're all enabled. But depending on it, once we start going through them, we won't be able to fire both T2 and T3. So this is, a, uh, this is an invalid state. You don't want to end up in this state. You want to make sure that um, place P3 has three tokens. Now, the problem then is in associating entities with tokens and transitions. So here's a way to make sense of a Petri net. So this is basically this scene Petri net, a little bit different initial marking. Remember the initial marking is we want to make sure these all can fire. And we can say, okay, let's associate place P1 with a variable A, place P2 with a constant 2, and place P3 with the variable BI. And we're going to associate these transitions with a multiply and add operations. Um, and so now this actually makes sense from, uh, a, uh, um, from an equation standpoint, because here is an equation, right? This is an equation. And in fact, this is going to say, ah, is going to control the synchronization of this equation how you multiply that out. Um, and the tokens are basically intermediate results, and they're the variables. Uh, transitions are the operations. And again, the creation of these tokens is tied to an external event. I mean, this is actually trying to compute this equation. So here's what's happening, is we're going to take two A's and multiply them together. OK? And that is going to produce a squared. And we see that, right, if these two a's get consumed by this multiply, and it produces a result, p4, which is a squared. And then um, we also have, over here is a multiply where we have bi. Now, of course, bi squared, since i is imaginary, um, it's the square root of negative one. So that is, in fact, uh, when we multiply that together, we're going to get a minus b squared is going to be produced here. Now, what happens with this multiply? We pull in one a, a two, and a bi. There's the two a bi, which all get multiplied together here producing that result. So these three places represent a squared minus b squared to a b i. And of course, a token is going to be produced for each one of these intermediate var var values. Okay. Now, when they're all there, they've been produced. And if one is a little bit slower, these guys are going to wait because you can't do this addition until all three values are ready. They've been computed, they're waiting there, and then this can fire. I remember these were marked with all with, with no no tokens. Okay, but now after those each fire, that filled, still can't fire that one. That one produced a token, still can't fire. Now that one produced a token. Now all three can in fact um, produce. Uh, or, or enable T4 to fire. That's the summation of the three values. And then, boom, a token appearing in P7 then indicates that this computation has been completed. Okay, so that is one example of how to associate 
specific entities, in this case, the uh, uh, components of an equation, to the tokens and transitions. Okay, so again, transitions are the operations, tokens are the intermediate results or variables.